So, um, I actually, now by the way, the title here is a bit different from what's in the program. Um, and the authorship is a whole lot different. Um, I, it doesn't matter. Anyway, these, these are the authors. I'm fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it, but both cases, a husband and wife. So it's just, I don't know, somehow something, the wrong husband and wife team. Anyway, so Sergey and Lilia Maligar um, are, um, well, okay, they, I could start with how they met each other in grade school, but anyway, that's, <laughs> but they, they are currently professors at uh, um, Alicante in Spain, um, but they're in transition. Sergey will be starting at um, the University of Santa Clara yeah, um, in the fall. And Lilia is with me at the Hoover Institution and also teaches at the Econ Department a bit. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is basically follow the last speaker's um, suggestion and keep things basic. Um, and so I'm going to talk about. Pardon? Mike, do you need to. Oh, you want for recording purposes or. Yeah, trying to record. Oh, because otherwise we don't need a mic. Anyway, so they're going to record this. Um, the NSA is doing it for you anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so this is this this act, This book was actually published in QE um, uh, two years ago. But I doubt that uh, I think it's very useful for a conference like this to give you the basic, simple idea behind this paper as well as our most, uh, the more recent efforts. The other advantage of this is that the code to do this is online and available for anybody to download. The uh, more recent paper, oh good, thank you. The more recent paper, the code um, is not going to be available until the paper's published, hopefully this century. Um, but anyway, so so this is in, in many ways uh, more advantageous to go with this. But the ideas are, are basic. Um, very similar ideas. Okay, so, oops, there. Okay. Now, if you're going to solve a dynamic rational expectations model, um, and by the way, this is not just limited to rational expectations. Um, uh, I'm working with Mordecai Crooks and his students to um, use these methods to solve models, rational belief models. I also think they can be used for methods can be used for dynamic games, etc. So, but we're just going to talk about rational expectations models just to keep um, things uh, focused so we can focus on something uh, basic. Um, now, what are the methods for solving these um, uh, problems? Now, I um, advocated um, projection methods and others, for example, like Christian and Fisher have um, built on that. And the key thing about projection methods is that, let's say you're looking at a, a growth model. And what's the state? Well, the state consists of things like the capital stock, things you control, and endogenous state variables, um, but then also exogenous things like productivity levels. And so that's your state space. And what you do mathematically what you do is you first specify some domain over which you're going to solve the problem. Once you specify that domain, then, um, then using the ideas um, behind projection methods from approximation theory, you then end up with an approach to approximate these unknown functions and then also um, choose which, um, uh, which one of these possible unknown functions is the best solution. Um, the problem is that uh, there's definitely cross dimensionality here because basically the domain T the typically the domain we have here is going to be a hypercube. Capital stock between min and max, um, productivity level between some min and max, you can do that in each dimension, it's a hypercube. And so the volume is going to grow exponential, well, excuse me, not, I shouldn't say volume. The complexity of the of arbitrary functions within an n-dimensional hypercube grows um, exponentially. Now another um, approach that uh, actually goes way back to B Bob Hall's PhD thesis and then also Michael McGill, um, 77, but um, is perturbation methods where basically you 
you you know the solution at one point in the state space, and then you do a Taylor series expansion around that using implicit function theorem. Now, this is um, very easy to do, and it produces, even in high dimensional models, and it produces approximations that are very good, but only if you stay close to that base point around which you're doing the Taylor series expansion. So you have a trade off here between these methods, the projection methods that are global in nature. However, as we go to more complex problems, the complexity explodes on you. Um, and in perturbation methods, um, the complexity, the com computation complexity grows polynomially in dimension. That sounds like a good idea, but the validity decays. And, and the, the decay of the validity is particularly bad in rational expectations models because uh, macroeconomists love to have their shocks be um, log normal. And so, of course, log normal random variables have an unbounded support. And going back even to Paul Samuelson, 1970, basically said, look, if you're going to look at models and you're trying to use small noise approximations, small noise doesn't mean small variance. Small noise means small support. And so that's been ignored by a lot of the applications of perturbation methods. Now, there's another approach, stochastic simulation methods. And the, the, the most prominent, the ones I know of um, along these lines is Marset's uh, parameterized expectations algorithm. And then also Tony Smith in his, I think, uh, it was in his PhD thesis, and this is, got published somewhere. But I don't, um, basically using um, simulation methods to solve dynamic programming um, problem. And by the way, the simulation method for solving dynamic programming problems is a very commonly used in, in uh, operations research. In particular, you look at the papers by Ben Van Roy, um, uh, Daniela DeFarius, and others um, using um, simulation methods to, um, to do dynamic programming problems. There, what happens is you basically make a guess for what the solution is. And my reference will be to Marset's parameters expectations. You make a guess as to what the consumption function is. With that guess, you then solve, you then just do a simulation to see, well, what would the world look like if we did follow that guess? But then you look at how, how the simulated data matches the Euler equations that are supposed to be satisfied. And what you're going to find for a random guess, uh, the Euler equations aren't going to be satisfied. But then you adjust things, um, you adjust your consumption function until you now have made a guess that actually, um, when you simulate it, it satisfies the Euler equations. Now, the, the um, good thing about this approach, which Albert has emphasized in, um, at least in seminars, I don't know how much in, in written stuff, you end up solving the problem only on the domain where the problem needs to be solved. Um, and that's an enormous advantage, as we'll see. I remember at a conference about 10 years ago, um, somebody at the conference said, you know, parameters expectations, dead, gone, not useful for anything. And I said, now, some, some of you are old enough to realize how shocking this was. I said no. <laughs> and I said the, 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 the really good idea of, behind of this is solving the problem on the states that are actually realized in equilibrium, and as opposed to all sorts of other states which aren't. Um, and also, it's simple to program, but the implementation um, that Marchette has is numerically unstable and really can't handle. Um, uh, it can do linear approximations, but um, after that, it can't. Yep. Well, yes, the, the, the easy way is, yeah, is to do that. Um, I, at one time, I thought, well, gee, you know, perhaps if I could do um, projection methods on a ball. Um, because if you, you know, economic, if you do a scatter plot of economic data, it often comes out looking like an ellipse. You do a linear change of variables, it's a, it's a sphere, it's a ball. And um, so, yeah, so I thought, oh, maybe I could, but then I started looking at the literature on orthogonal polynomials on balls. And then I said, no, I'm not going to do that. 
Um, it's not, um, the, you're right. There, there is certainly that approach um, that I actually there's some uh, a couple students at Penn State that are actually looking at this, but they have a great advantage on me in this regard. They I think they took physics at a university in Russia, so they're way ahead of me on this. So that's that's it's good division of labor. Um, but so that's why, um, yeah, um, Walter's actually right. But it just by the way, the other thing is I've I've grown with age, I've grown more sensitive to um, doing things that are um, easily understood by people with less math than I have. Um, okay, so okay, now we're okay. Now, <coughs> so basically, the stochastic simulation stuff I kind of described already. You make a guess for either policy function or in dynamic organ value function, simulate, and then you adjust your guess. Now, I'm going to show you, okay, now, what do we do in this paper? We um, basically sh um, show how to deal with the numerical instabilities that arise um, in other simulation um, approaches. Um, stochastic simulation methods um, in general have a problem with um, uh, going awry. Um, even in the dynamic programming literature, Ben Van Roy and, and his, some of his examples, what happens is that if you, it, it, it gets better and better and better and then something goes berserk and then it gets worse and worse. Um, there is a, a, com a, commonly there is an instability um, in these uh, simulation models. Um, what we do is we, we'll see what we do. We stabilize things. Um, and then also once we've stabilized things, we can dramatically improve the efficiency by brick pulling out some uh, basic numerical methods such as uh, uh, Gaussian, Gaussian mean quadrature. And so the resulting, model, the resulting approach is numerically stable and basically high, uh, comparable in accuracy to the projection, to projection methods, but at a uh, k something, anyway. Um, and also the thing is it's simple to program. And, and by the way, the, oh, I said the, the programs are available online. And um, since I didn't have any hand in writing the programs, that means that they're actually written in that lab. So another element of accessibility. So there is in that lab. Um, Well, I don't write code anymore. But Young Yang is writing it up in Fortran, and you've done it in C++. Yeah, Eric's done it in C++. Um, now, by the way, that's the way that we have to go. And I'll get into this. Um, I mean, MATLAB is kind of, is a, well, it, it has, you hit a wall if you stay with MATLAB. Um, OK, now, what's the? Uh, Uh, oh, this. Okay, it stopped responding to me. Okay. Oh, okay. Now, oops. Nah. This is a hypersensitive thing when it moves. Okay, the example is going to be uh, the one that we've seen ad nauseum, infinitistically ad nauseum, the simple one sector growth model. I like to call this, a, oh no, this is not the corn model. Anyway, this is capital stock and it depreciates and it produces stuff. And then A is a productivity level. And of course, the log of productivity follows um, uh, rent, uh, AR1. Now, what we're going to do is solve for the gross savings policy function. Now, what um, others have done is solve for the consumption function. Um, one thing we found is that by Doing this, um, we uh, end up with things that are a lot cleaner and easier to implement. But also, the general idea here is that when you when you, when you start thinking about models with, let's say, multiple kinds of people, and then you also have labor supplies and you have multiple kinds of goods, do you really want to have to solve for a consumption function for each? good for each person, each type of person. That's that. 
grows very big in size. And um, it is often the case that one can, oh, is this, anyway. It's often the case that what you can do is, you see, the intuition here is, if you know the, begin, the capital stock at the beginning of the period, and let's say you are told what it has to be at the end of the period, that's all you need to do to know to do the simulations of the states. Now, let's say you want something like individual consumptions and wage rates and all that price of stuff. Well, then, given the initial capital stock and given some specified terminal capital stock, what's left over is a static CGE model. So the idea here is to have your simulations produce a sequence in the state space, the Ks and also the exogenous variables A, and then every time you've got a KT and an AT and then a KT plus one pinned down, you then send that information off to the side to another processor, and it then uses a CGE algorithm to solve for what were the prices and the allocations of consumption and labor and all that kind of stuff within that one period of time. So by doing, by doing this kind of, um, by parameterizing the dynamics, and you basically can then leave the sort of the static, the temporary variables or the, uh, the, the ones that are not dynamic, the, you can have them be sent off and done in, by a different processor. Parallelism. That's the key to getting things done, is parallelism. And that's the one reason why, you know, uh, in the past, I would have never advocated a stochastic simulation kind of paper, uh, algorithm, because they are t somewhat inefficient on a serial machine. Serial, the world of serial machines has come to an end, outside of economics. If you want to do anything nowadays, and you're in physics or engineering, you go parallel. And I don't mean some wimpy two processors. I don't mean some wimpy four cores. I don't mean the wimpy 12 cores that I have on my Mac Pro. The one I have now and the one, the new one I'm going to get in January. All right, and you go to the Apple website, a beautiful machine, beautiful machine. Just buy it just because of the way it looks. Um, no, in order to do serious work nowadays, you have to have hundreds of cores, thousands of cores and more. But this is an algorithm that can make use of that resource to do big problems. Now, okay, here is the basic, um, here is the basic point of the, of the QE paper as well as the the one that uh, uh, we, bear, we, we uh, bear with a badge of honor that got rejected at Econometrica. Um, the idea is the following. We, we know that we just stochastic growth models. It, once you write down the solution the, the, and you, you simulate it, it's going to end up being looking like the Milky Way, except there's no big black hole here, no big little, no, no little clump there. But anyway, it's, it's scattered out along, roughly along a line, um, and it's of an elliptical shape. It stay, it's, it's in here a lot of, oops, okay. This is way too sensitive. Okay, so it's, it stays here a lot, but sometimes it goes out here and comes back in, and sometimes it goes way out here, and then it comes back in. Um, now, we only really need to solve for the optimal capital transition rule here, not out here, because the economy is never, almost, is, I, I can't say never, because by the way, if you have log normal productivity shocks, you could be today at any capital stock and tomorrow you're at some very different productivity level. So it's, it's at, in reality, the, the, if you stimulate it long enough, you know, it's cover the whole space, but, but to think that productivity can, you know, Increase by a factor of ten in a matter of a year is um, you know that's ridiculous. Now of course 
You can have productivity decline by a factor of 10 in a year. U.S. Air Force is very good at that in 1944 and 45. Um, but uh, it's a, a, a rise. Well, that too. You, you kill enough people. Up, I don't know. You kill the right people, productivity goes down. Um, anyway, you basically can have, a, a, in the short run, you can have enormous jumps in, in these in, the downwards, but not upwards. Anyway, so, so the mathematical difficulties that come from um, having unbounded shocks are ones that aren't really economically reasonable things to think about anyway. So I, I don't like it when people get hung up on, well, I have this normal random variable, and your method just blows up when I simulate. And my attitude is, well, then don't use normal random variables because they don't make sense. Um, but anyway, so that's the challenge. Now, you might say, well, big deal. OK, so the problem's here. And then, yeah, you feel in. But what? how much do you save? Not much in two dimensions. And by the way, it's inappropriate to look at an ellipse like that because you know that with a linear change of variables, you can turn the ellipse into a circle. So the relevant fact is that the largest circle within a square has 79% the area of the square. So by going from a square to a circle, <coughs> you've only reduced the area by 21%. Hardly worth writing home about, certainly not worth writing a paper about. However, if you go to three dimensions, then, and you have the largest sphere inside a hypercube, by the, the, the volume of the hypercube is basically half, the volume of the sphere, or the wall, is um, half of the hypercube. By the way, I, I, in mathematics, ball refers to the solid object, and sphere is just a, sur it's a surface. So that's, um, that's why you hear me bouncing around between ball and sphere. And this is actually wrong. This would be volume of a ball. But anyway, now then, as you go to higher dimensions, this ratio of the volume of the sphere to the volume of the cube, um, it, for example, in 10 dimensions, the, the, the cube is about 1,000 times greater volume than the hypersphere. And if you go to 30 dimensions, it's uh, you know, infinitesimal, basically, the ratio. So if you're doing even a 10-dimensional model and you are trying to do a projection method, you're going to need a thousand times more functions in order to approximate this 1,000 factor 1,000 increase in the size of the domain. So this is the advantage of focusing in on where the problem lives. Now. The problem, one problem is that we don't know ex ante or a priori where the problem lives. So now we're going, we're going to have a double um, problem of simultaneity or d decision. We've got to not only find some decision rules that satisfy equilibrium conditions, but that are also provide us with the right predictions for the ergodic distribution. So we, we've got to, basically what we need to do is to solve for the ergodic, by the way, I'm assuming that everything is, uh, everything is ergodic here, and so there's a unique invariant measure. But you've now got to uh, not only solve for the laws of motion and other functions, but you've also got, essentially also been solving for the um, ergodic, uh, the invariant measure. So you might think that that could be a problem. It turns out it's not. Um, and in some sense, we knew that from the simple examples of PEA. Now, <clears throat> let me. Oh yeah, it depends on model. I'm saying for this model, PEA sh was stable. You know, I mean, when. Oh in, no. You, yes, you. You make a guess, and then you make a new guess, and you hope it converges. We've never come up with a case where it doesn't. In fact, we've got some examples where you have a really bad initial guess, and you can, and then we show what happens to their the invariant measures, and it starts like over here, and then it moves, moves, moves. I don't know, but that's because it was a, a kind of model where you have a simple kind of um, you know growth model, so there's a strong notion of of, um, <coughs> of stability in there. 
Now, I think one, one thing that we, when we actually get serious about doing examples, these are examples that have unique steady states, and then our initial guess comes from linearizations around the, uh, around the steady state. And so basically, um, and that is a natural way to begin. And so if, if that doesn't converge, then you know you have a really perverse problem and in particular should not be using perturbation methods. Um, but yeah, but it, it's, we, ha we don't have a theorem. Um, the other thing, by the way, is that one way to avoid this problem is that when you do the simulation, and this is what you probably should do a lot of times anyway, you do a simulation, you get this scatter plot, and then you basically try to solve it on, you put like a little <coughs> extra belt of points around this so that you go beyond this a bit. Um, and that's, that's clearly going to be more stable and more helpful. Um, uh, and actually, the, the other paper, the, what we call EDS, that actually is um, much more sophisticated in terms of dealing with these kinds of fringe things, and so maybe more stable. But um, so far, yeah, we, we don't have a, you know, like, like most things, we don't have a proof of convergence. Um, it's a matter that it works on the examples we have, and it does so with high accuracy. And, okay, now let me, um, okay. Okay. Um, Okay, I don't want to get into describing um, parameters expectations. The key thing is that uh, in parameters expectations, you do a simulation, do a simulation, and then you look at Euler equation and stuff, and then to get a new guess, you do a least squares regression, actually a nonlinear least squares regression to get the new guess, and then and then you iterate. Now, here's here's where the problem comes in with uh, PEA, is that the regressions that you do have a severe multicollinearity problem, which of course is not surprising because, for example, the k and the theta, the different two in a growth model, k and theta are strongly correlated in a simulation. So when you try to write out some function that some uh, do some uh, regression to tease out some function of k and theta, um, there's strong multicollinearity between the two variables, and it's hard to distinguish. Now. Um, Basically, what happens is that the, the, the PEA works when you just try to specify a linear rule for consumption. <coughs> um, but then um, that's just, you got, it just, you're just regressing against the, the two variables separately. But then when you start putting in interaction in higher order terms, then you have severe instability problems because of multicollinearity. Now, let me show you what we do instead. Oh, okay. Um, by the way, where, okay, okay, the um, okay, yeah, mul this is um, Ill, it's ill-conditioned um, when you have multicollinearity. Now the um, so what do we do? One thing is that we um, we we do this uh, formulation of where we try to solve for the law of motion for the states, and then instead of doing least squares. We do other things. There's lots of ways of fitting a curve through a cloud of points. Least squares is just one of them. And there's uh, and we'll have lots of slides with different ways. Just here we mentioned um, uh, um, least squares by using a singular value decomposition for the X prime X matrix. See, the X prime X matrix is nearly singular. And so SVD says just toss out the dimensions in which... Uh, um, the eigenvalues are basically zero, and then just focus on the rest. Tikhonov regularization um, is also called ridge regression. Basically, you just penalize the coefficients for getting too big. There's a, and then um, LAD is um, least absolute deviations is a phrase from the statistics world. People tell me it corresponds to uh, quantile regressions in economics. Um, there, there's large numbers of ways of fitting a curve through a cloud of points, and that's what we're, that's what you're trying to do here. It turns out that least squares is about the only one that doesn't work, because all these other methods have been designed to handle problems of multicollinearity, and so uh, that's the first thing. And that's what that's the part that I'll be focusing on today. Um, okay. Oh, oh. So here's here's like a laundry list. Uh, least squares bad, but then you can do an SVD. Let me see. You've got the definitions. Okay. With least squares from SVD, you do a 
singular value decomposition of the matrix, and then use that to get your B hat, use the non-singular piece of it to get your estimate of the coefficients. Um, there's, oh, uh, regularized least squares. That's where instead of, okay, least squares just minimizes the sum of squared errors, y minus xb. But then what you, you know, you minimize that, but then you also add to it a penalty. So basically you penalize um, any uh, a vector b um, if it has a very high, if it has a large L2 norm. What happens with multicollinear regressions is um, some coefficient may be plus 1,000 and then some other ones like minus 1,000. And then it, because basically both linearity means that it doesn't it much matter whether it's one has a plus 1,000, the other has minus 1,000, or another one has plus 10 and then another one has minus 10. And so basically you just hammer it for having um, large um, uh, numbers as coefficients. And um, back in the late 70s, when I took econometrics, uh, uh, they were aware of multicollinearity. And then one of the supposed solutions was what was called ridge regression, which is this. Now, by the way, you don't hear much about ridge regression because even then people are saying, ah, shouldn't use it because there's no inference theory attached to it. Well, yeah, bias, no inference theory, all that kind of stuff. So. For statistics purposes, for inference purposes, bad. But we're not doing inference in that manner. No, actually, the bi the see here's the here's the thing is that bias refers to errors in the individual components of the b vector. We don't give a damn about the individual components of the b vector. We just want to have the function that is a good fit. That wouldn't be bias either? Uh, no, not, no. The big, well, not in, not in the way that, you're worried, that we normally think of bias in the coefficients. Because what happens, you see, the thing is that when you write things down, there are many functions that may have very different b's, but that in the L2 norm are very close to each other. And so the, what we care about here is getting some function that's close in the L2 norm to the true function. We don't care if it's close to the b's. Because by the way, remember, the b's are not something inherent. The, the coefficient b's depend on what the regressors are. Or in physics, it's frame dependent. The b's are not something fundamental. So we don't care about them. And what he, we care about is getting an L2 fit for the function. So I want to make that point because um, people see this and say, well, I, I'm not going to be caught using ridge regression. We know that's, uh, you know that's not good. Well, for our purposes, it's fine. And that's the same for a lot of these other, these other methods. Um, LAD, now LAD does have uh, an inference theory, but nobody wants to use it. Yep. Oh, oh, the right, okay. The, you choose a regularization parameter that is as small as possible in or, but before the, the computer blows up because of um, uh, round-off errors. So basically, what you, what, with this regularization stuff, is first you use a large B, and then you reduce it, you reduce it. But then when you get down to a point where your new X prime X matrix is on the order, the condition number is on the order of 10 to the minus 10, then you stop. Basically, you use the smallest b you can before um, round-off error and the uh, final precision on the machine uh, blows you up. So, see, th this is the thing you have to keep in mind. We're not doing pure math. We're doing math on a computer. Math on a computer is finite precision. And 16 digits ain't a whole lot. Carl and I had a problem some years ago we had to go to 500 digits precision in order to get the answer right. And it was the most trivial, simple computing of a portfolio in a simple Lucas model. We had to go 500 digits before it got right. And Carl, being German and very careful, said he's going to check out 1,000 to see if it was still the same. So no, the thing is that that's, that's now you say the B parameter, yeah. But you see, we're, this is the kind of stuff you have to worry about when you're doing Working on arithmetic on a computer, 
And my the projection methods avoided that by having everything be in an orth, having basically by orthogonalizing all the regressions on the right hand side. But that's hard to do, particularly when you don't know the measure here. Okay, LAD. Uh, there's uh, the slides has a whole list of basically ways you can do this, <coughs> and we um, and then the the paper has um, uh, sort of a horse race of the various things. Um, now then. Um, now what we do is we um, we parameterize the law of motion of the capital stock, and basically let me just remind you what the so okay what we do is okay let me just uh, basically indicate to you what we're going on here so. If you have the right law of motion for the capital stock, and then, by the way, once you know KT, KT plus 1, and AT, you can just compute out these consumptions. Um, oh, no, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. Stay with the simple case. Suppose you simulate. You simulate the Ks, and then you also compute out by the budget constraint the Cs, and then along the simulation, the... Um, the Euler equation says what? It says, erase the KT here and put a 1 here. So basically, in the simulation, 1 should equal the expected um, beta times marginal rate of substitution times uh, excess return. Now, how do I get a regression out for, for the capital stock? Well, you multiply both sides by KT plus 1. Remember, KT plus 1 is known for sure at time t. You choose it. So now we have kt plus 1 must equal this expectation. Um, if, if, your, if your decision rule is fine. So then what happens, we have a decision rule for the law of motion of the capital stock that generates some uh, sequence of c's and k's. And then we now do a regression of kt plus 1 in the series, or we then do a regression of k, sorry. But, okay. We then regress kt, oh yeah, k in, in the, uh, which, uh, this is, the tautology part is always the hardest. Yeah, it's, oh, I know, I know. Kt, but yeah, but remember, we, we're, we're now just replacing all the expectations with Observations. This is now empirical. I thought you were going to do it without so much. Oh, That's later, okay. and after I'm done with my time. Okay. I want to focus on just the sent the big, the the key thing. So the thing is that kt plus one should equal this. But then the thing is that kt plus one is also supposed to be just a function of kt and at. So now what we do is we <coughs> we. We take this simulation, and we get the simulation, and then we regress this, which is supposed to equal kt plus 1. We regress this, which is supposed to equal kt plus 1, on kt and at, and we get a new guess for the law of motion of capital stock. Okay? Yeah. So that's, and uh, so, um, yeah, you generate the kt plus 1s, you generate this CTs. And then the stuff, the empirical, um, the empirical expectations then regressed on the KT and AT. And then you iterate and you have to do some dampening, but that's the idea. Notice that this is a linear regression. Um, because wait, if, if, if this is, if your functional form is linear, is some, like let's say linear in some polynomials in K and A, and then K, this, um, the KT plus one appears linear. So this is going to be a linear regression. You just, you just regress this on a linear combination of functions of k and a. So it's a linear regression. And uh, so that's one reason why it's pretty much easy. Then basically what we point out is that perhaps your, your functions should not be the usual k, k squared, k cubed, and that. And OK, so here's, here's uh, some horse races. We first did <coughs> basically, um, now we, so this is not, this is parameterized expectations essentially, but where you parameterize the capital law of motion. And what we found is that uh, um, the 
the doing a linear approximation is pretty good. It's about as good as possible, and it was fast. Second order was also pretty good, but third, fourth, fifth, um, the multicollinearity killed you. But then one thing that you do, first, just to normalize the variables, just to take the k's and the a's and then normalize them so you're on the sphere, that gave you one more order in which you had stability without the multicollinearity blowing up. But then, uh, and then when you went to some better polynomials, uh, things were stable. Um, so then, uh, but then now notice here that when you did the least squares, I think this one was like the champion, least squares SVD, 10 seconds, nine, di nine digit accuracy. Um, LAD also got that, but it took uh, uh, over nine minutes. Um, I think this one was the champion most of the time. So that basically what happens is you, you um, by getting rid of the um, multicollinearity or using something that wasn't sensitive to multicollinearity, you're able to um, uh, get something much more stable. That was a case where you had 100% depreciation. Then we did the same thing where you had 2% per quarter de depreciation. And uh, there we were able to get uh, degree four approximation um, um, for uh, approximation easily. Um, now, okay, there is a point here where we use deterministic integration instead of the Monte Carlo. That helps things enormously in terms of speed and quality. Um, let me just get to some. Um, multi we have a multi country model, the same one that we used in the JEDC special issue. Yep. Well, we presume it's a full dimension of the capital stock and the productivity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, oh, no, 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 no. I see what you mean. We, we, the shocks are independent across each country, and and so. Um, No, as, as a sense of productivities are, have an independent component. Mathematically, it's going to be a full dimension. Yeah. Uh, well, this is a social planning problem. And there, yes, we, there, may, there may be some other lower dimensional representation. But we're proceeding as if we don't, we're proceeding as if it's uh, off the first order conditions. And so, yeah, we're keeping this. But it, this, this has full dimension. What he's talking about is the fact that even if it has full dimension, it could be very, very thin in some dimensions. Um, now what's going to happen is when we normalize the data, then it, that's going to get um, expanded. So uh, now it may be the case that a priori you have, uh, I'm trying to, I can't ad advance it again here, something. Um, so anyway, here's what happens when we did the, uh, we did 200 countries. And that, well, uh, that's 20 countries. We did uh, quadratic um, decision rules. Um, and so you have 861 coefficients. And uh, then this is the, um, in this case, oh, yeah, regularized least squares, Hermit um, quadrature. Let's say with the Monte Carlo stuff that I described. So two hours, you get nearly four digit accuracy, um, which is pretty good for having 20 countries and then 20 productivity shocks. That's 40 dimensions. With 200 countries, um, we were able to do a first order approximation of high quality, four digits in terms of the Euler equation errors, and in, um, in, in a half hour. Um, and so, th but, and then the, by, using numeric, by using deterministic numerical integration rules, we get uh, substantial speed up, uh, substantial improvement in quality, which means we can use much smaller sample sizes. But that's a technical detail I'll leave you to, to look at. Um, in the what, one minute I have left, uh, um, any, so the, the idea here is you do simulation, you then see how much the simulation deviates from the equilibrium conditions, and then you use linear regressions to get a new guess and, and iterate. And you um, by using um, these other um, 
regression type techniques, you can stabilize that. Once you got it stabilized, you then um, other parts of paper talked about how to make it more efficient. But basically, large, high dimensional problems are feasible. And now, then, what Yang Yang is coding up is uh, Fortran code to be used on machines where we have hundreds of cores. So that's going to be another order of magnitude improvement in size that we can handle. So, yep. Yeah. Other equation, both sides of the equation as well. It's very convenient. Yeah. I've tried it, it's not always stable. Oh, well, we always have the damping. We always put in the damping factor. But so sometimes, well, if, if you do, instead of having a policy rule for KT, yep. or any other state variable, oh. instead of having a policy rule for KT, yep. you have a policy rule for 1 over KT. Okay. okay. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah then. And, and, and for stability, that can make a big That could be. be. Um, but okay. I, think I think what's, what's important, important is that it be something that, 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 that somehow you encode up the k vector. vector. And, and 1 over k, k may be better. Yeah, well, I mean, 1 over the state variable. I think it wasn't with k that I found this. Yeah, yeah. 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 The inverse. yeah. That makes things a lot more stable. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the key, key thing, thing here is that, that, that I think that is, is, is when you do the regression, regression you do linear regressions. Now, now, whether, whether it's, it's in the k's or whether it's a nonlinear function in individual k's, uh, that I don't care as long as you have an inver easy invertibility back and forth. Um, but she thinks is, is, that, as, the problem with any simple example is it, it's hard to see which things are essential and which aren't. And but this is a great question because I don't care if you're regressing k versus k or 1 over k versus 1 over k. The key thing is a linear regression. And uh, no, that's, that's a good point. point. And, and then, then as, as far as stability, stability is concerned, concerned every time you do these other things, things, there's problems with stability. You use dampening. The other thing that Young Yang is going to do is, is use nonlinear equation methods to solve out for these coefficients. And then we can get rid of this damn annoying um, stability issues. OK? How would you handle uh, occasionally binding constraints? Can you hear? Yes, in fact, that's what we do in the other paper. The other paper, in fact, on one of the examples, um, is um, zero lower bound on monetary policy. And we're able to get uh, at least one order of magnitude better order of oil equation errors in that case than the log linearization does. Um, and basically, the short answer to this is you've just got to be um, sort of come up with a way of expressing the decision rules in a manner compatible with that um, kink. That uh, you, you have to have uh, things, functions in your basis that uh, can handle that. By the way, my first, my, my first answer, the zero answer to your question is get rid of the goddamn constraints because there's no such thing as a hard constraint in the world. I mean, everybody can borrow some money, some, you know, sometimes. The real fact in the real world is that the interest rate is rising as you borrow more and more. And so the, the, the way the borrowing constraints are formulated is mathematically hideous. Um, in uh, to go to more dimensions, and it's just wrong economically. There are people that have debt, even though bar models of bar constraints would say nobody has any debt. So first of all, smooth the problem out, and then also have a basis for the approximations that can handle however you dealt with smooth. Can I also ask, uh, how did you choose this eta here? I missed that. Oh, the oh, eta is the. Uh, Penalty parameter, yeah. and it's just uh, it's just you you guess you you start big and then reduce it until um, it doesn't affect things. In the regularization literature, there's something called the elbow approach. You start with the with the big penalty, and then you you shrink the penalty, and then when the change in the penalty doesn't change your answer, ah, then you stop. By the way, there's some part of the statistics literature. Associated with Grace Wobble. Well, cross validation, I think some of the ideas here are similar to that. Um, so, but that's, but yeah, this. That could be faster. You just do this uh, half, half off. Just leave half of the sample off, compute here, and check on the other half. Well, no, that's an inference thing, and we don't care about that. No, no, this is cross validation. That's, uh, that's cross validation. 
Yeah. yeah. You just estimate on one half of the yeah. sample, yeah. Yeah. and then check the accuracy on the other half. And you just look for the yeah. uh, error that would give you yeah. the, so, the best prediction on the other half. Yeah. So, so this, this this is computational engineering, not economics. This is, you know, how big does it have to be so that the multicollinearity problem doesn't kill you? That's what this is for. And so that's, there is no rule. That's the guess. And the thing is, everything else is so damn fast that a little guessing on ADA doesn't slow you down. Okay. Well, I should. Thank you.